So what I am hoping to do over the next 20 minutes or so is share some of my experience and some of my advice as to some principles for how to navigate this challenging environment in which you uh, are wanting to communicate. Insignia helps uh, organisations to plan, train, exercise and sometimes handle either crisis events or challenging issues. And I think within science, technology and engineering, you have some of the trickiest, most challenging uh, events, incidents and issues uh, with which to navigate. Why is that? Well, I'd like to start by kind of looking at the other side of the fence. Why is this such a challenge? And I think we're all communicators, I think, in this room. I think one of the um, first things that we have to do in any communication situation is to put ourselves in the shoes of the people with whom we are communicating. And we've heard that already in the first uh, two presentations, and I'm absolutely going to echo and in some cases repeat uh, some of the insights from those first couple of uh, presentations. But what I would say is it's all too easy to get into the mindset of why don't they get it? Why don't they understand? We have fact, evidence, rational thought on our side. Why don't they just get it? And as I say, like in all communication situations, I think every now and then you have to go back and cast aside that frustration and Im literally imagine yourself in the shoes of the people that you are seeking to explain, communicate with and influence. So let's go on that journey. How does the world look like from your average member of the public who is receiving this information uh, about science and technology. Well, the first thing that we need to recognise is that these days people have a much lower risk tolerance than they ever did in the past. If you think about the things that our parents and grandparents felt were acceptable and the things that they had to endure and experience and the fact that death was often a lot closer and so was serious illness than it is today, there is a sense that people are looking for a no-risk environment that everything should be guaranteed 100% <coughs> safe. So we are communicating with a group of people for whom uh, risk is not a pleasant or an acceptable concept. We have to recognise, and we've talked about trust, and I've got another uh, chart about trust, a different one which shows the uh, uh, proliferation of statistics, but declining trust in all authority figures, whether it's politicians, the media, the church, the BBC, all of those big authority figures are less trusted than they were in the past, when there's much greater deference to someone in authority saying, this is the situation. If that authority figure said, this is the situation, then people would tend to believe them. In fact, Nowadays, if you're in a position of power, how we define power, there's almost a predisposition not to believe you. However, here's my trust chart. This is the Edelman Trust Barometer, the most recent one. It's an annual uh, survey of the degree to which um, different types of individuals and organisations are <coughs> trusted. This, these statistics provide, I would say, relatively good news. The most 
the three most trusted uh, types of uh, people are one, a person like yourself. So again, it's to Jude's point, actually influencing friends and family or people with whom the people that you want to uh, influence perceive to be people like me is incredibly important. Actually, we trust those peers as much, if not more, than almost any other group of people. But level pegging with people like yourself are technical experts and academic experts. So actually, according to this study, compared with CEOs of big businesses, guess what the bottom one is? Politicians, or even NGOs, <coughs> interestingly, according to this study, technical and academic experts are trusted by more people than many of the other uh, groups. So we do have an opportunity um, to communicate with credibility. The final answer um, in the previous session talks very much to this. In all industries, in all businesses, in all organisations, we all have our own language, our own acronyms, our own shorthand, our own ways of talking, which is fine when we are talking within our club, but is not fine when we are talking with people who are not in our club. Add to that what Jason was alluding to, the fact that um, technical people, whether they're scientists or engineers or academics, in general, are used to communicating in a, in a more detailed, specific, nuanced way. And the fact we're talking about science, so there's lots of jargon, there is a massive danger of not connecting with the very people with whom you need to connect because we aren't talking their language. And I would agree with, again, Jude's point about the media training. It's almost, it kind of feels, I think, um, sacrilegious to a scientist or an engineer to have to communicate something in one minute. They would feel much more comfortable, feel it's much more appropriate to talk for an hour. But you know what, if we want to get our point across, we have to find ways of doing it in one minute. And we have to find alternative ways of communicating that remove the three, four, five syllable words that 99.9% .9 of people listening simply will not understand. <coughs> and again, someone talked about the evil scientist earlier on, but you know, there is massive misunderstanding, fear, and scepticism uh, about science, by its very nature, it has the potential to be scary. And people like me, who are not from uh, a scientific background, don't understand it, and we fear what we don't understand. And bad things have happened with regard to science and technology. So. That fear that begins with misunderstanding is reinforced by some of the horrendous things that have happened related to science. And, of course, that is all fuelled by those in the outrage business. Um, controversy makes news. And so, for the media, um, science, danger, risk, people... They're all great elements uh, for a story and for the activists that have a particular cause or perspective. It's also uh, perfect ammunition. But most important, and again, Jude's uh, Facebook um, post played to this, I think possibly the most important thing we need to remember is... As a member of the public, when I'm hearing about a new scientific or technological development, I am viewing it through a personal lens. What does this mean for me and my children? It is not about 
the theory, the concept of this development or breakthrough or new way of doing things, what does this mean for me and my family? And children are so powerful, I think, in these scientific and uh, technical debates. So, some principles. This is uh, originally the work of Peter Sandman. There's a second chart I'm about to show you, but you're probably aware of this concept of outrage, um, which is what we see from the people out there who are concerned about something. And if we look at Peter Sandman's uh, matrix here, this, uh, this matrix is the level of hazard, how big the risk is of a particular thing. And on this axis, um, the scale of outrage in response to that particular risk. What he found was there is no correlation between the level of risk and the level of outrage. So, in no way are people more outraged by things that are more risky or less outraged by things that are less risky. It isn't about the actual fact of the level of risk uh, involved. What this chart shows is, as communicators, kind of the, the job that we need to be doing, depending upon the correlation between or rather the, the, the amount of hazard or outrage. So, in a situation whereby the risk is actually very high, but outrage is low, we actually need to be communicating proactively, guys, you need to be concerned about this and you need to take steps. That's often the case in a health issue, the Ebola situation, for example. Going back in time, you know, seat belts. People weren't concerned that they weren't wearing seat belts, but actually the risk of not wearing seat belts was very high. When the risk is high and concern is high, that's when crisis communication kicks in, and I'll talk briefly about that uh, later on. Outrage management, I think this is a lot of what we're talking about this morning, whereby the level of concern actually outweighs the level of risk. And that's where um, we need to communicate smartly to try and bring the thing as a minimum kind of into, into balance, whereby <coughs> the level of concern matches the level of risk. What Peter Sandman also found was the level of outrage, the degree to which people were concerned, could be kind of mapped against these 12 factors. And if what you're doing ticks a number of these boxes, then outrage is likely to be uh, higher. And I think if we think about some of the things that we've been talking about this morning, there are plenty of these uh, criteria that could be ticked. If you're getting more ticks in this column, then you start from a better uh, position. So, let's just talk about some of the principles for issues management. What do we mean by an issue? It's effectively misalignment between an organisation or an industry's perceived behaviours and the expectations of its stakeholders. There is a mismatch between those two things. And in simple terms, this is how an issues management programme works. Horizon scanning, so looking out there, finding out what is happening at the moment that could affect us, what is coming down, uh, down the track, identifying what those <coughs> issues are, prioritising them, which have the power to do us most harm, <coughs> analysing them, understanding them, working out who the key stakeholders are, who the influencers are, developing a strategy to deal with that situation, implementing it and evaluating it. So, 
that's a very top level issues management uh, program or an approach to issues management. So what is the strategy going to be? Again, I'm afraid I'm not going to give you any um, final solutions, but some thoughts around different types of strategies to adopt. One, of course, is the ignore, just do nothing. One could say take the uh, ostrich approach. Sometimes, very occasionally, ignore is the right strategy. By actually communicating about it, maybe... If it's not a significant issue, maybe you draw a necessary attention to it. But ignoring is rarely an appropriate strategy. Arguing is rarely a good strategy. You go right back to what I was saying at the start. If it is simply, why don't you understand? Let me just tell you, you are wrong. That is unlikely to be an effective issues management strategy. So that probably leaves us with two alternatives. Listen, so understand what the concerns are. Influence, educate, persuade people to feel differently. And very much, again, to Jude's point, it's really the people in that middle part of the curve that we saw that were seeking to persuade and influence. Or listen change our behaviour because actually, do you know, they have a point, and then communicate what changes we have made. And of course, another possibility, which is quite often the case, is a combination of these two, or an area in between these two. Partly us changing, partly us influencing them to change their, change their views. Amy, what time do you want me to be finished? Okay. Again, I just want to reiterate uh, this point. As we implement those strategies, we need to constantly remember that it's a battle of heads and hearts. And, you know, again, we heard earlier on someone saying, but I just don't feel it's right. We know that in a battle between heads and hearts, hearts will often win. So as well as communicating our rational arguments, we do need to engage on an emotional level as well. It's personal. Remember all the time, it's personal. So, what are some of the ways that we can start to overcome those barriers? Well, one of the key things I would suggest that we need to do is to try and communicate personal benefits, not just general, conceptual, theoretical benefit, but how could this benefit my life? You know, we saw the ban the mobile phone masks uh, protests from, what, 10, 15 years ago. The benefits of having a mobile phone are now so well established that those protests have gone away because people see and have experienced the actual benefits of having a mobile phone. We could argue about whether they're, um, whether they're totally beneficial uh, these days, but communicate what this development means for you as an individual, not just at a general society level. Advocate regulation or safeguards. Because people don't believe us, because we're authority figures, the more we can do to reassure, not just by saying, trust us, believe us, but by actually saying, yes, there are these safeguards in place. Yes, we encourage regulation of us, because we want to be um, seen to be a safe, responsible organization. The more chance you will have of being trusted. Consult. Um, consultation as something new is being introduced, I do believe, uh, is very important, but it does need to be done genuinely. This is um, Crossrail, um, and you need to be prepared to listen, engage, and, where necessary, make changes based on that consultation. Involve trusted, independent third parties. This is one of our mining clients where, you know, it's very important for that client to engage with the local community, but it isn't just them telling, they involve community leaders, trusted third parties in the communication. It's not just our clients standing there out front telling everyone that everything's okay. So who can you engage? Who can you have 
speaking on your behalf, who can you have as part of your um, third party panel to lend credibility and to um, defuse the what well, they would say that wouldn't they perspective. Finally, most of that, um, what I've said thus far, has been about issues management. There may be situations when whatever you are doing, where the issue turns into a crisis, or you simply have a crisis event within your organisation. This is the um, Samarco tailings dam in uh, Brazil, which was breached. Uh, 18 months ago and caused massive environmental damage as well as a number of people losing their, losing their lives. So, if you are doing something controversial or risky, here is a checklist of things that I suggest you should be considering in terms of crisis management. A reputational risk assessment. Being good scientists and technologists, I'm sure that all of your organizations will be doing the operational technical risk assessment, but as communicators, we should also be doing a reputational risk assessment. What could happen that could damage the reputation of this industry, this organization? Which of those are most likely? Which of those are most damaging? Having done that, do some scenario planning. Map through those five most critical risks. How could they play out? How would we respond to them? What resources would we need? What next steps do we need to take to actually make the risks less likely to happen or to make sure that we're ready to respond if they do? The red team, I think this is a really uh, useful mechanism, particularly when you are developing a new technology um, or making a big positive announcement have a couple of people playing the role of devil's advocate. So everybody's going, rah, 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 this is fantastic, this is great, this is going to change the world. Have a couple of people <coughs> kind of role-playing the critics and the naysayers. What would they say? What are their challenges like, likely to be? Where could it go wrong? How could this turn into a problem rather than an opportunity? Um, have someone challenging the conventional wisdom that this is a a great idea. Develop crisis response plans and processes <coughs> in response to what you found out so that you have checklists, contact details, template um, statements to be used in case something goes wrong. Fundamental communication material development. Spokesperson, team and frontliner training. Absolutely, you need an empathetic, articulate, authentic spokesperson available in the event of a crisis, someone who can communicate on a human level. But by frontliners, you know, what happens if someone turns up to the front gate here? What's the person on the front gate going to say if a journalist turns up or a camera crew? What's the lady on reception going to say? So it isn't just the spokesperson, the people in the front line need to know what to do or say in the event of an incident. Rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Um, <coughs> it's great to have all these plans, but unless you have exercised them, you will never know whether they will work in practice. And what will likely happen is because you have them, they'll work quite well. But wouldn't it be better to rehearse them, find out they work quite well, adapt them so they work very well if it happens for real? And of course, the other benefit is people just get used to deploying those and continue to monitor and research what's happening out there so that you can be ready and primed um, for if the worst should happen. So, in summary, um, do constantly take a moment to put yourself in the shoes of the people with whom you are communicating. Understand how what you are doing looks to them, not just how it feels to you. Understand this concept of outrage and determine what your best issues management strategy is. And prepare for the worst in terms of your crisis management response should the worst occur. Thank you.